Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. So a number of the primates are actually very straightforward. There are some that are a little bit suspicious, you know, that may may take a little bit longer to, to convince. It is a totally different vaccine. So the technology is different um, and the manufacturing um, facility is totally different. So we, we know how important it is to make sure that there's vaccine availability for all people um, to, to assure a healthy human population and we are not diverting anything for animal use. So do you anticipate that eventually every animal in the zoo is going to get this vaccination? I'm Sarah Fenske. Last week, 29-year-old Jimmy Yu got vaccinated against COVID-19. Not such a big deal, right? Every day, slowly but surely, people are getting their shots. But Jimmy Yu isn't a person. He's a chimp. He lives at the St. Louis Zoo. And last week, he became the zoo's first animal resident to get his shot. It's an experimental treatment that the zoo plans to be the first of many. And joining us today with the details is Dr. Sathya Chinadure. He is the Director of Animal Health at the St. Louis Zoo. So, Dr. Chinadure, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So, how did Jimmy Yu get chosen as the first animal in the entire zoo to get vaccinated? Well, we, we prioritized which species we were going to be vaccinating first. And our great apes and our big cats were our highest priority animals. And once we had the vaccine um, delivered from the from the company, Jimmy Yu just happened to be the next animal that was scheduled for, for a, a preventative health wellness exam. So the timing just worked out really well. So what made the chimps and the great apes the highest priority? So we've been communicating with other zoos around the country, and a number of institutions have seen clinical cases of coronavirus um, disease in their in their great apes and in their big cats. And, mm. you know, we, we're in constant communication with other zoos around around the country and around the world about what they're seeing in their animals. And based on that information, we really prioritize those groups. In some cases in these other zoos, are the animals actually exhibiting symptoms and, and they're getting genuinely ill? Yes. Uh, yeah. Most of this, um, the clinical cases have shown signs similar to what we'd expect in a person Mm. with upper respiratory um, signs, coughing, sneezing, nasal discharge, those things. Um, Very few, very, very few severe or significant cases, but um, a lot that have those kind of mild to moderate infections. Hmm. And is that the reason that we could see this more in in animals like great apes, that this is a shared DNA situation? We have more in common with them than, say, an earthworm. (laughs) Yes. uh, We should. We have the potential to share a lot of diseases with our primate um, uh, relatives. There are a number of upper respiratory diseases that we could transmit to an ape or an ape could potentially transmit to a person. Um, it's a little less common for us to see this type of disease transmission go from from a human to something like a big cat, but it's mm-hmm. still definitely possible. It's interesting. I'm remembering those headlines from maybe like a year ago where they had those mink farms in Denmark where so many minks were getting this that they were worried that this could lead to some sort of new deviation. Do you have any sense of what about minks <laughs> would make them also in this camp? So, so mink are interesting. Mink are a close relative of the ferret, and ferrets are actually an experimental model for some respiratory diseases, including influenza, um, mm-hmm. in people. Um, so they there are there is precedent for that family, the mustelid family of minks and ferrets, getting respiratory diseases that would also affect people. So does that concern what was happening out of those mink farms? I feel like there were just terrible headlines there where I remember being almost the most scared I was at any point in the pandemic when we were talking about this mink problem. Is that part of what led to these vaccines being developed for animals in the first place? Yes, that was not only a huge tragic loss of, of animals, but a huge financial loss to some of those those individuals working in those mink farms. And that was part of the impetus for the design of this vaccine. Obviously, there's a there's a huge economic cost um, associated with losing farmed animals, and that, that spurred the development of this vaccine. And then, thankfully, we were able to use that same vaccine for, for other species. Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, that's great. Now, I, I mentioned when we first started talking about this that this was an experimental treatment at this point. Is this something where we're worried that maybe these chimps could have a reaction? So we use the term experimental because just like the human vaccine at this point, it hasn't gone through full FDA approval. And it doesn't mean that it's untested. So it's been it's been tested in the laboratory for you know many times. And we are, like I mentioned, in regular communication with a lot of our colleagues around the world about any reactions they're seeing in the species that we would be vaccinating. So a number of other institutions have also been vaccinating great apes and big cats and sharing that information very readily. So we know that based on that information, based on other people's experiences, what we typically expect as a reaction would be maybe a sore arm or potentially some mild lethargy um, the day or two after the vaccine. So some symptoms that are similar to what uh, some people have had after their vaccines, um, but not as significant as, as a number of people have had after their COVID-19 vaccines. Okay. And I understand that um, after Jimmy Yu, you've now done uh, some other chimps, you've done some orangutans, you've also done some big cats. Everybody so far is, is coming through this without much of a reaction? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so far, we've done about th- uh, 35 animals as of today. Um, again, mainly the great apes and big cats. A few smaller animals. We've done some some foxes, um, some smaller primates like lemurs. And so far, everyone has bounced back very well from this um, this exam and from this injection. Boy, the idea of trying to administer a vaccination to a fox. I'm sure this is just old hat. You're doing this every day. But when I think about that, that seems like that would be really complicated. What tends to be one of the hardest animals to vaccinate? Well, the nice thing about a lot of our animals is they have a great relationship with, with their keeper staff. And so through a lot of positive reinforcement and training, we're able to administer a lot of our vaccines to animals um, voluntarily. Um, we'll train them to, to accept an injection. So a number of the primates are actually very straightforward. There are some that are a little bit suspicious, you know, that may, may take a little bit longer to, to convince. Um, and then we have a number of animals that we will vaccinate um, during their routine exams, which happen under anesthesia. And those anesthesias can sometimes be a, a pretty complicated process. We want to make sure we've got all of our, um, you know, all of our ducks in a row. We want to make sure we've we've planned for all of their preventive health needs before we put them under anesthesia. So sometimes those are a little bit more complicated, not necessarily hard. So Dr. Chinadere, I'm actually going to cut in here. Our producers are somewhat concerned about um, the quality of your phone line. They're going to call you back right now on your phone line, um, and we're going to continue this conversation there. And in the meantime, if, if you're enjoying this conversation on St. Louis on the Air, we're talking to Dr. Sathya Chinadure, um, who's the Director of Animal Health at the St. Louis Zoo. You can join our conversation before, during, and after the show by finding us on Facebook. You can search for St. Louis on the air there. That's a great way to be a part of what we're talking about. You can find podcast episodes um, of conversations after the fact. Um, and I understand that Dr. Uh, Chinadure is back with us. Are you there now? I am. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, thank you for dealing with us on that little pivot. Um, so we were talking about how in some zoos, some of these uh, great apes have developed COVID-19. I understand the St. Louis Zoo has either been lucky or, or maybe very good. Uh, so far, that hasn't been the case here. Well, uh, we have not had any cases here in any of our our animals so far. We've had no animals showing clinical signs and no animals testing positive, which is which is great. Um, there's a little bit of a luck, but it is a lot of preparation. So there, are, as I mentioned, there are a number of diseases that can move back and forth between humans and non-human primates. And so we do take a lot of routine preventative precautions, things like wearing masks. Um, that has been a routine PPE for us with primates for a long time, not just because of this. And having that basis of preventative health and and uh, risk assessment has really allowed us to then ramp up our PPE, ramp up our biosecurity once this outbreak started, and we're able to to try and control um, any potential for spread from from any of the people to the animals or vice versa. And when you say that no animals have tested positive for this, how frequently are you testing them? So we are not routinely testing. It's a CDC recommendation that we don't do routine um, testing of animals that are asymptomatic. Now, we've had a few animals that have had an upper respiratory infection, potentially for another reason or just been a little bit off. And because they were a high-risk species, we tested them to make sure that they were not positive for COVID-19, especially if, if um, human staff were going to be working closely with them. Okay. So this feels kind of like almost a spot check, the fact that people or animals are occasionally getting tested and they're coming back clean. There's a sense Correct. this is not just spreading through this zoo. 
Absolutely. Well, that's great. And you said that you have your um, uh, you have the keepers have been wearing masks even before this when it comes to some species. I also think about the the setup of the St. Louis Zoo. I feel like I might be close enough in some cases to some of these animals that that my droplets could even be close to them. And you know, prior to this, I wasn't wearing a mask. Is that something where you're going to rethink some of those things going forward, or is this something that would just be a zookeeper issue once we get this pandemic licked, which I continue to feel confident we will. Um, well, we when when the pandemic started, we did take a really hard look at all of our exhibit setups and see where there's potential for guests to come into close contact with any any species, especially the high risk species. And so that led us to to change some visitor walkways. It led us to change some access to certain areas um, just to minimize that potential for spread. But when we design any new habitat for any new animal, we always take that in, into into account. We want to make sure that we're maintaining a safe space um, so that there is no risk of disease transmission, but but our guests are still able to to see our animals and interact with them in a, in a meaningful way. Hmm. I'm thinking about your penguin encounter, which I absolutely love, and it's nice that we can still get so close to the penguin. So can I take it to mean the penguins don't have a mink kind of situation here? I'm not going to be passing them a disease. Uh, yeah, so far um, there's been no reports of, of COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, affecting birds. Um, so we're still able to work with our birds in a, in a similar way that we have been always. Hmm. So thinking about this vaccine still in the experimental stages, but seems like it, it's doing great for the animals who need it. Um, you know, there's so many people around the world who still don't have full access to vaccines. Is this the same pool, um, you know, ingredients that could be used for human vaccines being diverted to animal vaccines? Or is this a completely different animal? No, that is a, that's an excellent question, and uh, it, is a, it is a totally different vaccine. So the technology is different, um, and the manufacturing um, facility is totally different. So we, we know how important it is to make sure that there's vaccine availability for all people um, to, to assure a healthy human population, and we are not diverting anything for animal use. Mm-hmm. So do you anticipate that eventually every animal in the zoo is going to get this vaccination? We, we're still working on a very risk-based approach, so uh, we will still prioritize which species we think are most susceptible to contracting the virus and, and stay with that. I don't think at any point will we be vaccinating every animal at the zoo. We may expand out from the great apes and the big cats to other mammals if, if more evidence um, comes, to, comes to light that, that there are cases in, in other, other types of mammals, but I think it would be very unlikely that we'd expand beyond mammals. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Sathya Chinadure, uh, Director of Animal Health at the St. Louis Zoo, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury with audio engineering by Aaron Dorr and production assistance from Jane Mather Glass. It was mixed and edited by Aaron. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.